call the December 18th, 2019 regular meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 regular board meeting to order. Mary, may I have a roll call? Yes. Jalowick? Here. Peyton Ho? Here. Figaro? Rago? Ramirez? Here. Ting Pol Pong? Here. Wiedemann? Here. Please join me in reciting the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, Marianne, if you would please read our Fenton mission and belief statement. Sure. Our mission, to cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Our beliefs, successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engaged learning, school and home collaborate effectively, we provide a safe, secure, and caring environment, we infuse social-emotional learning into academics and culture, diversity empowers our learning community, we prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibility. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, we move on to recognitions. James and Rick, please present the recognitions this evening. Good evening. It's uh, the end of the term, so we've got some culminating uh, recognitions for extracurricular activities. Um, and a lot of times I'm up here touting people for academic stuff or for their achievements uh, outside of the classroom. Today we get both. So we've got three young men from the football team with uh, Coach Matt Lynch. We'll introduce them and acknowledge them. And I will give them their awards. Good evening. Um, we have um, three student athletes that receive recognition, both on the state level and also on the area level. And the first one is Nicholas Ben. Um, you can come up here. <laughs> um, Nick was nominated by the Daily Herald um, as a member of the um, Honorable Mention All Area Team. Also, Nick was honored by the Illinois High School Football Coaches Association as an academic All-State recipient. To be a member of the Illinois High School Coaches Association academic team, you must be a member of the first team all-conference, and you must accumulate a uh, GPA of 3.5 or higher. And Nick has accumulated that and, was, and received honors as a um, before because of his academics and because of his play on the field. So Nicholas Ben. <laughs> the second member is Eric Moreno. Eric was also nominated by the Daily Herald as a DuPage County Honorable Mention All, All Area Football Player as well. And also Eric was recognized by the Illinois High School Football Coaches, Coaches Association for the academic All-State team as well. And he received the same honors, Eric Moreno. <laughs> oh, you did, <laughs> okay. Andre Bess. Andre Bass was selected by the Daily Herald as a first team all area football player recipient. Now, um, in order to be an all area first team recipient, Andre is competing against all student athletes in, in the whole DePage County area. Andre um, rushed the ball 221 times, which is the leading rusher in the whole county. No other running back um, possessed the ball as much as he did, and he did not have one fumble which was very impressive considering that. Yeah. <laughs> considering the nature of the offense that we run where he's running mostly inside where he's got to run against all the big guys and also um, the next player to him had five fumbles and only a hundred and some carries. So he, he, he did a great job. On top of that, Andre was named Illinois State High School Football Association, honorable mention all state. So he received all state honors in that area. On Saturday, 
Andre was elected and selected to participate in the Illinois High School Football Shrine Game, which sponsored, which benefits the Shriners Hospital. Andre is the second member of Fenn High School to ever receive that honor. Cal Cassiopo played in it last year, and Andre will be a member on the team this year. And I have a letter to read from the Illinois High School Football Coaches Association. It is our pleasure to inform Andre Bass that you have been selected as a member of the Illinois High School Football Coaches Association All-State Team. As honorable mention, you are to be congratulated on your achievements and those of your teammates. As coaches, we know that this honor reflects many hours of sacrifice and hard work by you, by your teammates, and by your coaches. The Illinois High School Football Coaches Association want to also congratulate your parents, the sacrifice they have made reflect the love and support that have been given to you on the road to this honor. Andre Bess. to speak? Not this evening. Nothing. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Um, District 100 reports. James? Sure. We got a list here real quick. Uh, the first one up is STR with our facilities update. Um, Alan, I forget your last name, sir, but here he is, Alan from <laughs> STR. <laughs> you have nothing to be ashamed of with forgetting last names. Yeah. Kind of like Prince, just one name. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. I'll Thank go you. with that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan. You've met Colby Lewis from our office earlier. I'm, I'm filling in for him. He's recovering from some shoulder surgery, but mm -hmm. I promise not to be too memorable. Um, <laughs> good, to, good to see the people that I've met before from the board and happy to, happy to meet the others that haven't. So tonight, I just want to give you a little overview of what we've been doing, how we're doing in terms of progress, and what we can anticipate going forward. Uh, just a quick recap, uh, talk a little bit about schedule and timing and uh, some of the tools you may see as we, as we move forward. Next, please. Again, we're looking at everything. So we've divided up by discipline and really specialists in each piece are looking at every facet of your facility, the, the roofs, the mechanical, the plumbing, literally everything to give you as comprehensive a picture as possible. Next, please. And, and we're going to take that information, uh, analyze it in terms of what needs, what efforts need to be done to maintain, and what may be in store for replacement. Put costs to that, and assemble that in a manner that makes it easy to understand. Uh, one of the problems with this sort of endeavor, you end up with literally thousands of line items, and I don't expect anyone to decide what to do with thousands of items. But we have some techniques we'll look at in just a little bit. Uh, so we've been marching forward. We've really been uh, uh, going through the spaces. Virtually all the disciplines have, have gone through everything. Uh, we have still have some more pieces to see. We've seen probably 90% of the building now, uh, and we're closing up on that. Uh, we should, we'll be done with that this month. And in late January, we're going to present a draft of our findings, kind of in a book form. There'll be an electronic version as well. Uh, and then we want to come to the board with those findings and recognize this is a living document. You know, we're not, uh, it's not an absolute. This is the way it's got to be. There's some flexibility to it and really how we can interpret that and look for opportunities to move forward to resolve some of your issues. 
Um, again, we've, we've touched virtually every discipline. I think kind of my big takeaway, I live not too far from here, so I've been by Fenton literally hundreds of times. And of course, you always get a vision in your mind, wow, you know, that looks like it's in pretty good shape or that looks like it could need a little love. Uh, but in reality, in terms of your building, it's in better shape than I would have expected. I mean, the structure, the, the major pieces of it are, is better than I would have expected and better than many of your peers, to be blunt. Um, many of the components that are designed to be worn and replaced are worn and need to be replaced. So surfaces, mechanical equipment, but that's good news because those pieces are compartmentalizable. It doesn't mean you have to do big, giant chunks of it all at once. So again, that, that works to your advantage. Next, please. And well, I had to check, and you know, your building's just a little bit less than 300,000 square feet, and if anyone needs to be reminded of how big 300,000 square feet is, come along with us when we go into every room and look at every, every wall and every surface. This is, a, this is a big school, so there's a lot to see. Next, please. What have we found? Uh, some things are obvious that you know about. Uh, certainly the historic site issues in terms of uh, not being able to use your facilities completely because of uh, uh, how it's designed to retain water and things like that. Natural wearing elements, I think you've known for some time a lot of your paved surfaces need some attention and those are designed to only last so long. Uh, track is okay, but definitely on the backside of its, its useful life. Next, please. One of my biggest surprises being an all masonry building, in reality, your outer shell is in pretty decent shape. There's certainly some things that need some attention, but the brickwork is in good, good shape. Virtually all the seams between the brickwork, windows, and doors is gone. All that needs to be uh, caulked and replaced. The good news is that's not a huge undertaking. Uh, one of the disadvantages of being a school like yours where it's dominantly one floor, you have a lot of roof. You have proportionally more roof than you, you might see in a building your size. But again, uh, you have a lot of different roof panels. You have 64 different roof panels. And they're, again, in better shape than most of your peers. Some of them need attention, but not all of them do, thankfully. Next, please. Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. No <laughs> One of the things that really struck us, though, is looking at your classrooms is the sizes. Uh, typically, for what we'd see and against national standards, the sizes of your classrooms are on the smaller side. Uh, science rooms are really almost dead on the average, but a lot of your classrooms are relatively small. And there's other things that make them behave smaller. You know, some of them have the mechanical unit in along the window there. Some of them have built in millwork. So again, you're taking a, a, perhaps a 650 square foot classroom and it actually is behaving a little bit smaller. That limits you a little bit in terms of what we can do in terms of flexible furniture and things like that. But that's something that we, we want to explore a little bit deeper. Next, please. Science rooms, again, dead on, uh, a little dated. You know, there certainly are trends in education and the advent of next-gen science has impacted science layouts and accessories that you see within science. And even though yours were state-of-the-art in the day, they, they are kind of over, over their hump. Next, please. Some of your spaces are pretty good. Commu compu com consumer sciences is really first rate. You have a lot, of, a lot of useful facilities and a lot of accessories there for them. Some of your other spaces, though, that haven't been touched, uh, coral, band, they're OK. Uh, again, they definitely need some love. Uh, one consistent theme we've seen throughout the building is general lack of accommodation for handicapped accessibility. Uh, you see it in some of the fixed rooms, um, uh, and th that isn't so bad, but we see it pretty pervasively. You see it the washrooms for all practical purposes. The vast majority of washrooms are not accessible. Next, please. Oh, this is good. No, I went too fast, sorry. Uh, another thing we've seen, though, is comfort level and just even the evidence of, of lack of comfort level. Um, a few of the rooms have supplemental cooling in them. Some of them have makeshift deflectors on the uh, heating and air conditioning ducts. And comfort is really statistically really closely allied to student achievement. It's, it's really pretty amazing how, how close that tie is, and I think that can be improved. 
Um, you've improved a lot of your rooms, and so there's some mates. Art is an example where you have a, an improved art room and then you have an older version of an art room, so a little bit of equity issues uh, across that. Shops are really nicely proportioned. Those are, those are good-sized spaces. You've done work in those. Those are really... Those are really nice. There's one or two that kind of miss that improvement cycle that definitely needs some attention. The graphics department is, is, is rather poor. Uh, another kind of systemic piece is the bathrooms. Um, and this applies to all bathrooms. Athletic washrooms, faculty washrooms, student washrooms, both in terms of capacity, <coughs> Uh, fixtures, clearly some of the fixtures are original to the building, no, no question about it. Um, and the washrooms need some attention. I have a question on that. Do Please. We, do we meet the criteria of per capita restroom to person? That's a great question. Um, intuitively, we have not done that calculation yet, but I'm suspicious that you don't. I th if, if you meet it, you just meet it. Um, and there's formulas and, and codes that, that really govern that carefully. So it will be interesting if we move forward to make some of those handicap accessible. Yeah, you typically exactly right. So if we're at the line, then yeah. We have so to so we so we really need to comply with that. Yeah. And I think also too, there's some good news here too. You can make facilities that are easier to clean, look cleaner, behave cleaner. So there's some, there's some long-term savings there too. Uh, science, uh, again, uh, good, good bones on the science room, some of the prep rooms and things like that, surfaces that need some attention that weren't designed to be used with some of the modern chemicals. Next, please. Okay. I have never seen a facility where people have been so creative in maximizing the use of their existing millwork. I don't know who's been doing this, but somebody's done yeoman's duty to really get your max. You've, you've achieved value out of those original investments. The bad news is you're, you're kind of over that hump, too. So a lot of the millwork need, needs attention. That, that, that's pretty systemic. Next, please. Uh, surfaces. The flooring, there's a lot of flooring issues. Um, you know, there's some, been some settlement in the building which has exacerbated that. Um, there's a lot of vinyl flooring that needs to be addressed. Some of the carpet as well, you don't have a great deal of carpet. Um, that'll be a, a major undertaking simply because of the areas involved. Ceilings as well, clearly the ceilings were often done with the sound abatement and some of that has achieved its end of its useful life as well. Next, please. Again, structurally, the building is very sound. In the second, in the two-story wing, we've seen some evidence of some settlement cracking. Again, nothing that's a problem. It's just something that needs to be addressed. Not uncommon at all. Uh, but uh, again, given the scale of your building, there's less than I would have anticipated. Mechanical is another obvious thing. Uh, I, I think there's the natural life cycle to the equipment, but I think the biggest potential advantage is controls. Your controls are not very sophisticated. There's been a lot of improvement in that recently, whereas those controls are relatively expensive to replace. You really have the opportunity directly to recoup energy savings from that. That's something that we're going to have to look at uh, that really closely. There'll be a lot of options within that. Next, please. Okay. Some things have come up that, you know, really are nothing that, that you've done, but uh, codes have evolved. There's some new codes that apply, so those things will have to be brought up to date. Um, being a kid from this area, I, I, I've watched and I, I can prove it professionally that your piping will last 60 to 70 years and that's about it. It's just like every other school I've ever worked in in a 10 mile radius here. A lot of your piping is original piping and it is going to have to be replaced. Uh, it's really amazing when you uh, cut a section out of the existing piping. A four inch pipe is really a half inch pipe just by all the calcium and deposits. It's really incredible. So it gets pressure issues and things like that. And that, that, that is gonna have to be addressed in relatively short order. Next please. Electrical, somewhat similar. Uh, 
there's few things that have changed in schools more than electricity use over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, I have never seen classrooms that have such little power in them. Uh, it's amazing that your, your programs have been able to kind of creatively work around the system here a little bit. That's something that's going to be need to be addressed. You just need more capacity. It's really just that simple. Next. So how do we make heads or tails out of this? Um, we have a process where we will take our findings, and this is an example for another district, um, where we assemble it into natural families of work. So you really kind of describe a minimum, uh, a minimum plus uh, sort of scenario. You define scenarios that directly impact educational spaces. So you put m dollars and time frames to those. So you assemble them into groups to make choices. <clears throat> Next, please. And we have a process that allows us to take perhaps your strategic plan, uh, perhaps committee input, board input, to create a criteria across the, the top here and then test it against the four or five schemes, again, those nested schemes, and see which schemes meet the criteria and which ones don't. Uh, decision making at this scale is, is, is really, really a challenge. So we really try to drive it to a binary choice. It either meets the criteria or it doesn't. And you can kind of do the squint test and see, okay, well, you know, the, the first two schemes accomplish a great deal, but they don't perhaps really accomplish only 50% of what's in their strategic vision, um, whereas some of the others are, are a little bit more holistic and to do that. Again, this will be criteria that will be customized to you, your preferences, your goals, your values, versus what you have with your building. So that's really about it I have for tonight. Uh, we're going to have our drafts um, next month, uh, essentially uh, uh, almost a month from today. Uh, and we'll have those final, final findings for you the month after that. One other thing that's come up since uh, Colby presented the other day, there has been real progress made in the uh, school grant arena. Uh, just uh, 10 days ago, they released the school maintenance grants, which again is a $50,000 matching grant. Not all the money in the world, but I'm certainly uh, uh, it can tick off a couple projects on your uh, your program. So that's definitely encouraging. It's the first time that's been in seven years, six years. So yeah, there's going to be a round of security grants in January. Those rules haven't been set yet. And they had a committee meeting earlier this month for the larger school construction grant program, again, to set those parameters. That's certainly of high interest. And again, that's $2.5 billion spread out over five years. So depending on what the criteria is, and how we made up with it. We're very skilled and we're really aggressive with those grants. So uh, as the expression goes, if you don't ask, you don't get. I want to be a party of your team that asks. So, all right, thank you very much. Thank Let's you. Thank you. Thank you. So we go from facilities to a little more of social emotional. Uh, uh, Principal Lazarevich and Mrs. Toe. Is that here? She's sick. She went home sick today. Okay, so, so it's just it's just you solo. So unfortunately, you just can't. Okay. <laughs> Let's give Leo Von a hand. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so over the last couple of years, as you know, we've been up here and we've talked about our social emotional learning that we've done. We started with our adults, um, and we've. Now move, we're moving on to our, our kids. And part of the, our next phase is to then do parent outreach and then obviously allow our board to kind of see what we're doing with our parent outreach. So recently we, um, we were with Padres Unidos. Uh, we've done some other things with our bilingual programs. Uh, our PTO we're going to uh, go out to. We've talked to our Fenton boosters, our, our athletic boosters. So we're trying to get out to our parent groups to talk about our social emotional learning here at Fenton. So. <clears throat> uh, so the Bison Way, this is our SEL mission. You guys have seen this uh, hopefully several times. Uh, we talk about it as, uh, are you behaving in the Bison Way? You might see it in our taglines for some of our, our um, for some of our people. Um, this is just a way for us to make sure that we are, we are making sure that we have a safe, caring, and empathetic environment. It matches a lot of our beliefs that we have within our strategic plan. Um, we just say, you know, are you behaving in the bison way, or is this, a, is this the bison way, so to speak? So uh, 
um, this was created out of the SEL committee, which was, uh, um, and Ms. Mrs. Toe is not here today. She's actually our coordinator for that. Um, she kind of put that together. We went out and asked staff. We asked our students um, and, and had some input from families as well about what, what this would look like. So this is where the bison way has come from. Uh, so these are just our goals, uh, implement the evidence-based SEL program. So we're currently working with our freshmen for Ruler. Uh, we had to start somewhere, so we started with our freshmen this year. Um, then it'll be a freshman sophomore program, and then it'll be a freshman sophomore junior program, so forth and so on. So again, we started with the adults, this year the freshmen, and then we're going to take it on through, through, through the, West, uh, the rest of our student body. Uh, so what is SEL, our social emotional learning? As parents, we know that there is more to raising a child than teaching reading, writing, history, and math. Raising a child means that schools and parents must work together to create safe and supportive environments while helping children to understand themselves, understand others, and make responsible decisions. It's important for children to see that they have role models that aren't always the ones that they expect to have. You know that saying that um, parents are the first teachers, that's, that's very true because I think that as a school there's only so much that we can do. I think parent involvement in school is huge because I think it's really important when kids feel the partnership that their families have with a school. And so we work to have structures and systems in place that will help kids be able to do those things. Social and emotional learning, or SEL, is how children and adults understand and manage their emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. When adults are modeling SEL for students, whether it's parents or teachers or staff members, they're really building relationships with one another, which ultimately impacts how they work with one another as adults. I think it's really, really important for them to be self-aware. I think being able to identify their emotions and deal with them, it's sometimes really important to be able to stop and reflect. We're intellectual emotional creatures. To learn the skills necessary, one has to have both a healthy internal life and external life. And so being self-aware of that is really critical. First of all, we have to learn how to manage our stress ourselves. How to deal with stress in today's society where everything just seems to go 90 miles an hour. You have to just take a time out yourself. I mean, it's important for it to be shown to him that there's different ways to deal with stressful situations. Teaching how to deal with emotions. Like, did we give them the skills to be able to handle conflict or resolve conflict? When kids are able to process their own feelings, acknowledge what's going on with others around them, not only for others, but for oneself, right? Forgiveness and what, what led to this? How might I do this differently? They have to have a sense of empathy. They have to have respect for other people, um, other cultures. I want him to learn how to interact with other kids, how to play, how to cooperate, you know, how to do things together also have fun and I think that has been the best thing with my relationship with my daughter that she's able to communicate well with others speak her feelings that's important because the world around us is all about relationships our children need to be able to guide themselves through there so that they can achieve those things that they need to achieve and be able to communicate them effectively I'm always thinking about how are we potentially impacting students in a way that will make them think twice like how are we helping them make good decisions. He's starting to understand that why do one thing instead of another and how it affects other people. Explaining to him his actions have influence on his quality of life. I think our children need to be able to be confident enough to articulate what they're feeling and to be able to just showcase their strengths. Those five competencies apply to being successful anywhere. That's the kind of employee I'd like to work with. That's the kind of student that I'd like to have in my classroom. That's the kind of person I'd like to study with after school and that helps build a positive climate and environment that sets the tone for learning. Research shows that SEL can have a positive impact on school climate and promote a host of benefits for students, 
including better academic performance, improved attitudes about school, fewer negative behaviors like office referrals or drug and alcohol use, and reduced emotional stress. Every child can reach their full potential and are provided the supports and the resources that they need to reach that potential. My hope would be that families are engaged and feel welcomed at the school and can get the resources that they need through the school. In order for students to meet their full potential academically, I think that you know, their social and emotional needs need to also be met. Social emotional learning is something that people can learn and that we can help to teach that. My wish or my hope is that schools see themselves as places of support for kids and families and community. We are their number one role model. Between modeling and direct engagement in their education and direct engagement with the school and the teachers and participating, the parents are the number one educator from day one. Those strategies that mom and dad share with them are also the same strategies that schools have shared with them. As students learn social and emotional skills, it's important that they have opportunities to practice and apply those skills in real life situations, both at school and at home. One of the ways that parents can help children at home through the use of social emotional learning is to connect with the school. Whether it is attending local school meetings, parent teacher conference, emailing their teachers, I think it's just important in whatever way you feel you want to engage to do so. Parents can help bring SEL into the home in many ways. Here are five examples to consider. For self-awareness, Take time to talk about feelings with your child every day by sharing your own feelings and asking your child to name their feelings as well. For self-management, teach and model positive ways of managing stress, disappointment, and anger. For social awareness, use story time to develop social awareness by asking your child how they would feel if they were in a similar situation as the characters in the story. For relationship skills, develop your child's ability to resolve a conflict by asking questions about the situation instead of giving advice. For example, try asking, what do you think your friend was feeling when that happened? Or, how can you work to make things right? And finally, for responsible decision making, talk to your child about consequences by asking questions like, what might happen if you choose not to wear your coat if it's cold outside? Or, how might your friend feel if you choose to cancel your plans to get together? Okay, so um, thank you for, um, for taking the time to take a look at that. That is something that we're currently doing with a lot of our students. Uh, the empathy piece, we're really having conversations about um, how their awareness, decision making, um, as we look at things like restorative justice and things like that in our building, we want to make sure that we are, are reaching them. We're part of a cohort right now uh, with Castle within DuPage County where we meet with other schools and we talk about some of the things that are going on. Uh, Ruler has been part of this uh, for us. Uh, Dr. Mark Brackett out of Yale University, he created um, or he put together kind of this ruler mindset and it's uh, the idea, he actually has a book out called Permission to Feel. I don't know if you guys had a chance to, to take a look at that and he talks a lot about um, how you can express yourself and what that looks like and so what we are what we're doing currently is we have uh, I believe it's 11 or 12 teachers that have volunteered uh, to give the ruler uh, training we do that every Thursday with our students our freshman students so they volunteered so they've taken the, the, a specific uh, look at their themselves as well as the students that are freshmen and so every Thursday we do ruler training for them and then we teach them vocabulary which is important because sometimes we get confused on uh, are you angry or are you disappointed and things like that so we try to teach them what the difference is between the two um, I actually sat in one where they talked about the difference between uh, jealousy and envy uh, and I thought that was interesting to, you know, because the kid's phrase now is jelly, right? Oh, I'm jelly, right? And I'm like, I don't, what, I'm jam, I don't understand. Um, but it, it really gave them a good, it gave them a good opportunity to, to discuss the difference. So Ruler is just kind of this social emotional approach. We started again with our freshmen and we're going to move on uh, as we continue to go. Here is what Ruler stands for. I won't read it to you. I My 13-year-old has no problem with E, just so we know. <laughs> 
And I think L is really, really important, labeling it appropriately. What is it? Again, we talked about, is it anger or disappointment? Uh, Dr. Brackett actually talks about a story where a, um, a a, at home, parents were having an issue with a, a student and the son who was going through ruler training. The mom said, why are you so angry? And the kid said, oh, Mom, he's not angry. He's just disappointed because after dinner he wanted to go eat, wanted to go outside and play, and it's raining right now. Blah blah blah. And the mom was like, "What is going on in school?" You know. And so, um, so these are all important. Kind of, they're extremely important for our students as we continue to move forward. So, um, so last year at the end of the year, we created a charter as a school district. Uh, I'm sorry, as a school. Um, and then a lot of our teachers have actually created charters within their classrooms instead of rules, right? Now it's a charter and how do we behave in that manner? Uh, we have the mood meter this year as well. That's increasing our self-awareness and emotional regulation. I think we talked about that at a previous one. If you guys take a look at my computer, you can see there's like a small little mood meter on there. All of our students have it. Um, Mr. Batson and his team, now when the students open up their Chromebook, a mood meter actually pops up when, on their Chromebook. Or yours too as well. Well, we figured you guys needed that also. So uh, I'm glad that worked out. Uh, and then now we have a meta moment. And um, you'll see around the building there's, uh, and we've done a great job, Joanna Rieger and, and kind of her team that, that they've put together. They do a lot of this advertising for some of this and going forward. And the meta moment is really about kind of being your best self, taking a moment and instead of kind of, you know, yelling and screaming is like, okay, what's the best self that I want to portray right now? And I've actually found myself doing that with my kids at home. Like, usually I'm apologizing for not being my best self with them. But, uh, but I, you know, using the, again, using the terminology and using the phrasing, no different than we would do in English or in, in our social studies when we talk about a class, uh, our classes or, or math, making sure that they use the terminology, this is the same for them. We want to make sure that we have it. And the final thing is kind of a perspective taken. It's that blueprint, where are we as we go forward, so. Okay, uh, so here we are, again, it talks about where we're going, uh, grade nine, grade 10 next year, uh, we're talking about mindset, vision, goal setting, again, very, very important as we go forward. Um, grade 11, uh, leadership, how can we find different leadership, building these healthy relationships, and then grade 12 as they get to kind of exploring the self-talk, what's my best self after high school, uh, stress management, which is, which is extremely important. Uh, Dr. Brackett talks quite a bit about where stress lies on kind of the scale and the sequence to it. You know, we start with anxiety and fear and then we wind up being stressed about it because we were anxious and fearful and then that actually comes true kind of at the end. So it's interesting to, to see some of that as we go forward. So, um, and then there's parent resources. Uh, we have our own Fenton SEL website that, uh, that you can get to. It is connected to our, our current website. So again, the, the push here is to make sure that our parents have an understanding of what we're doing on a daily basis. Um, uh, our, our curriculum teams, as they meet for our skills progression, part of what they're doing for their competencies is they're adding SEL inside of each of those competencies as well. So they teach that as they go along. We, we can't, just, can't just layer it on top. It's something that we actually have to teach and we have to be explicit about it, not just hope that they get it. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Any questions about? Thank you, Yovan. Oh, All right, great. Thank, thank you. you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So we go from uh, SEL, uh, social emotional learning, to teaching and instruction and learning. It's all connected. It's, it's all connected. <laughs> it's, all connected. <laughs> it's all connected. I mean, so I think Michelle that's. Papanicolau yeah. And Mike Barago. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, I introduced a series of updates we were going to do over the um, next few months. and. Um, we're continuing along the path of personalized learning, and I, I can't thank you enough for talking about SEL, because that's something that we talk about with personalized learning all the time. It's like how to make it personal. Well, to make it personal, you really have to know your kids. You have to know where they're coming from, and you have to know how to build those relationships. So this SEL is really infused everywhere. It's even infused in my kid's school, because my three-year-old asks me to talk about her feelings once a week. And I'm like, OK, feelings. We'll talk about feelings. But um, one of the there's a lot of different approaches you can use in a classroom to achieve a personalized learning setting. And we have some teachers, some of you are just out for um, like Kelly Torres's 
uh, exhibition for criminal justice, that's project-based learning, where you can see students really exhibiting their work in a public forum in an authentic manner. Another approach that we've been using is blended learning. So I thought tonight um, you could stop listening to me so much, and you can actually hear from all of the practitioners that are working so hard. Um, and um, th for this segment, and again in our discussion and action items, um, I've asked some of our educators and our division leaders, which are also educators, but our teachers and our division leaders to come and talk about the work that they're so passionate about because our teachers are really digging into this work and they're just outstanding. The innovation that's happening is amazing. So I brought one of our greatest innovators, um, <laughs> Mike Barago, to talk about blended more specifically. Um, I think he does a nice job of defining it and explaining the why. So. Um, I'll jump in if you need me, but it's all yours. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, first, thank you for having me. Um, so let's start by understanding what blended learning is. It's, it's a combination of learning and leveraging technology um, for students to learn on their own online uh, and direct learning from, from the teacher. And so, uh, so this, was a, uh, this was a big thing that people uh, were talking about, and we got a chance to uh, learn about how it's done at Huntley High School. Uh, I, I got a chance to go there twice and learn about what, how they do it and uh, best practices and so on. So, uh, so it's been a great experience. Um, last semester, um, so spring 2019, uh, was the first time we piloted it uh, with my, my group of students and actually a couple other, I think a couple other classes also. Um, and it's, I, I think it's been quite a success. And so let's talk a little bit about why uh, why I found this. So oh, not FOIA. We're not gonna, is there another yeah. thing to this? That's okay. Oh, it's in my, uh, <clears throat> That's okay. Uh, no big deal. Um, so I, talking about why, uh, what, what actually struck me when uh, visiting Huntley High School uh, are a couple of things, two or three things, to be honest with you. Um, with blended learning, what it does, it allows um, students or teachers want to step back on how to uh, engage students in the learning process. And what that really means is that instead of the traditional classroom in which I, I stand in front of class, I deliver the content, um, we've been doing that for so long. And the biggest problem with that, and, and I start to see that now when I actually step in front of a classroom and try to teach, uh, in that you could have half your class already know the content. And what you're doing is you're really wasting time for the students that already know that content. You're, you're repeating it for them. Uh, with blended learning, it allows students that um, that are already knowledgeable about the content to move on and learn more new things. Uh, and then the kids that actually need the time uh, from you, you get to go spend time individually or in group uh, with them. And how it works in uh, the way we have it set up in my class is, uh, and actually in other classes that are trying to do it, uh, any student that has a grade of 80% or higher, they have the opportunity to blend. And what that really means is that at least the common practices right now is that three days out of the five days, they can go elsewhere in the school. Um, they can come here in the ARC, they can go to the commons, where they can kind of um, work on things either to advance in the content that they're learning in a class or actually have the option to, um, uh, to work on other things for their other classes and whatnot. Uh, and going back to, uh, there you go, there's my guidance right there. Um, going back to the why here is that um, the, the things that really struck me with this is that it gives me, uh, one of my favorite part about this is that it gives me a chance to work with the kids that really, really need me. I'm no longer standing in the front of the classroom delivering uh, uh, one content to everybody. Uh, I can actually sit with individual kids and talk to them about what they really need. And then the kids that are actually advancing, that actually know the content already, are advancing pretty well, um, they get to learn. And one of the favorite things I um, learned from Huntley High School is that they get to learn the process of being really independent. Um, when they leave my classroom on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, it's their time. Uh, they're not with me. Uh, they're given the opportunity to spend that 45 minutes on their own. And they really have to understand how to manage that time. Uh, and based on data that I, I wish I got to, I'm going to show you guys some stats here in a little bit, but uh, um, in terms of uh, things that students have said, one of the favorite things I've, that was repeating in terms of data that I've collected from them is that they've really learned how to manage their time in terms of 
what they need to prioritize, uh, where they need to allocate time for, and it's really helped them. Uh, the kids that are that were doing so well in my class, that are doing so well in my class currently also, uh, they're allocating that time that they have right now on their own to put it in classes where they need it. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're teaching kids how to be independent, we're teaching them how to, uh, how to spend their time wisely, and we teach them how to relax also. I have kids, it's funny because when, when it comes to blended learning, uh, everyone gets really, really nervous leaving the classroom. You have a kid that's like laying, taking a nap in the corner over here, but I can't be mad at that because they're getting an A in my class. And if they want to spend that time to recoup uh, because they haven't had sleep because they're working on AP Physics or whatever classes they've been working on all night long, that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. So uh, it's, it's really giving that opportunity. And again, my favorite part about it, it's not just the kids that are advancing. I get to sit down with the kids that actually need me. So uh, that's been very helpful. Um, can, I, can I press this button? All right, here we go. Um, so I have um, <clears throat> a couple uh, sets of data here in terms of when we started. So um, 2000, spring 2018 to spring of uh, this past year to this current fall. Um, I, you guys can see here, I, I'm not an expert in statistics, but I can tell you something. It's not the magic bullet, right? It's not like everyone's getting an A. Uh, that's not what it's all about here. Um, if anything, when I look at this data, it's telling me a couple things. Um, one, uh, the data is pretty much the same for the most part. There are some fluctuations. The mode is a little bit better over to the right. Obviously, there's more kids that are su uh, succeeding. As you can see, there are more students uh, right now because we have two classes now, which is great uh, for AP Computer Science. Uh, but to me, the important thing that this uh, data tells is that um, it's not causing issues with grades. That's number one. But I'm able to spend more time with indiv individual students that need me. Okay, uh, and so to me that's big. Uh, those are huge things because um, the, the thing that people are really, really nervous about when it comes to blended learning is like, I can't be with them every day so that means they're gonna fail or I'm not gonna be able to help them and so on. But the numbers speak for themselves. They're doing fine. They're learning how to spend their time. They're successful still in the classroom. Uh, but really to me the biggest part is I'm spending time with the kids that need me and able to help them out. Um, uh, in the classroom and whatnot. So uh, those are, to me, those are the key takeaways uh, in terms of blended learning. So any questions? Yeah, did uh, any of the kids who you allowed to leave and to do whatever they needed to do, did their grades, did you see any dip in their grades or? Uh, so, so in the, the beginning, beginning, yes, absolutely. Um, so and, and, and that's the funny part, I, I wish I had, I had enough time to prepare the, uh, that anecdotal evidence uh, from them, but uh, a couple, a couple kids, kids were like, oh man, I got too lax. It was too lax, you know, I had too much time to myself. But towards the end, they picked it up and they were fine. They actually came up on top, uh, just, just like they were in the beginning. They learned the consequence of their... They, they did, because what happens is every week, um, their blended status changes based on what their grade is. On every Sunday, their status changes. Uh, I update their grades every Sunday, which... Um, People always talk about how easy it is to be a blending class. It's not. It's actually a lot of front load work. Uh, it's a lot of prepping. It's a lot of things just to make sure things work uh, flawlessly, hopefully. Um, but every Sunday, the grades have to be updated, and they get an automated email to let them know if they're blended or not. And the kids that, you know, they slack for one week, they, they know. They know what they admitted, and so they pick it up, and you see them. Uh, they work hard, and they submit everything, um, and it's worked out. So. <clears throat> in terms of, so, so on the left is just traditional, and on the, the other two is the, the model for blended, correct? Those, those, those are the two, two classes, classes that I was able, able to run them on. So um, in terms of the class sizes, you've got a total of students of 28 there, and then, uh, and then it, it, it jumped to 49. Uh, so that's two classes. Two classes. Right. Two oh, I yeah, see. So, so we have two classes of 80 computer science, science this year. I see. So okay. the 25 and 24, respectively. I see. Yeah. This is AP computer science, you yeah. said? Yeah. Okay. And the requirements are 80% or higher, yep. like you mentioned, to be, be eligible or qualified for blended yep. education. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this semester, we, I, I kind of went with what math is doing. They, um, they added, if they're missing any assignments or tests, they couldn't blend also. I made a little bit of tweak. I learned a little bit about that. I made a little tweak. If they're missing two or more assignments, then, then they can't blend. They need to come see me to make up those things. But for the most part, they kept up with all their work. Would, would, would there be ever a time as this evolves into more 
I, I mean, you know, you look at geographic blending, so they could be at home and work and then come in. Is that where? So that's exactly, exactly what Humvee's, Humvee's doing. doing. Yeah. Uh, Humvee Who's has kids where they're blended for half the day, so they don't have to show up. Yeah. Uh, for all half of the day, they're at home. They're doing. Or some kids are actually going to work in the morning uh, because they're on top of their work. They're blended. They're fine. Uh, so that's absolutely. Um, right now, the biggest. Um, Another big complaint that I get from the students when I collect data is they don't have enough space to go to. And that's going to be, we're, you know, our school is not designed to be a blended school. So we recognize that. We've done everything we can to provide them with space. But that's the number one request they have. Our first period kids last year, they were like, do we need to come? I'm, I'm getting an A in your class. Do I have to? It's not my class. someone else's class. But do we need to show up? But we're not, you know, we don't have that protocol yet. So, so then blended becomes distance learning as well. Absolutely. Yes. Correct. Yeah, we're looking at different spaces throughout the building that yes. we can transform <coughs> into more yeah. lounge, comfortable, um, independent learning spaces um, because they're going to need them. Um, our teachers are seeing the value in helping our students become more self-directed in their learning through this. And just, I don't know if you need me to talk into this or not, no, but no, I'm going to no. talk into it. So um, we recently, just last no, earlier this week, Monday, it's been a long week already, um, we, our instructional coaches um, invited 15 of our alumni back to talk with our teachers and hosted a nice session. And we, we gained a lot of insight from our students that are currently at the college setting. And two things came up in there. And one was really related to this work. They said, our time is so structured in high school that when we get into a setting where it's less structured, we don't always know how to manage that. And that's a skill we didn't get to develop when we were here. And they said those words. I wish I was tape recording it at that very moment. But I was like, oh my goodness, that speaks directly to it. They talked about a lot of other things that gave us a nice rationale for the work we're doing too. But that in particular. And then we asked them how many were engaged in online learning to any degree. And the majority of them raised their hands. So, this really requires our teachers to set up an online learning environment. So it is a lot of front load work. I mean, it's, it's knowing where your course is going and how you're going to set up um, the ability to respond and flex to the needs of the students, but still have a plan in place from the beginning to the end of the semester. I want to make sure we have an understanding. There is a state code that requires students to be in class for a certain amount of time. So we can't just dismiss a student to go do home learning. Mm -hmm. So the next best thing for us is blended learning because then they still have a teacher or facilitator to, to what's going on. So we can't just say, oh, you have to do everything from home. The only way we have that right now is through e-learning, but that's through a, a, um, yeah, a specific reason for that. Mm -hmm. So we currently can't just say, hey, you know, Sam, you're doing great. Go ahead and stay home for your five classes. And do <laughs> there, is a, there, is a, there is a requirement by the state code for them to be here for a certain amount of time. So um, just so we don't, I, I don't want it to be the belief that uh, the philosophy is we're going to, you know, yeah. teachers are going to work from home, students are going to work from home, nothing's like, no, there's still a we're state worried, requirement. Yeah, so we're just right. worried about how to get some more spaces inside. Yeah, yeah, we want more spaces. <laughs> um, but that's where Alan, wherever he went, oh, that's where Alan. we were going to ask for oh, Alan. He so, missed yeah. that comment. He was so oh, he knows it. He <laughs> knows. <laughs> he, he made my He knows. Yeah, he called me and Alan though. Yeah. He really understood, like, the implications mm -hmm. of the design of the building on learning. I was taking I want to make sure we have that understanding. We're, no. we're not sending students home. No, that's, I mean, that's what we've learned about how Huntley does it, but we have not set an aim towards Although that. my kids would have really benefited from this because they were, like, very intent and in getting homework and everything done at night, and they worked really late. So to be able to sleep mm -hmm. in the morning mm -hmm. and then come in, you know, miss, you know, they're kind of reversing that a little yeah. bit. That the, the they would have utilized that time for sleep, not work. A little more, a uh, little more, I think, um, Directed towards self-regulating, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, self-control, uh, time management, those things. I, I can see it be advantage. So it's really some of our cool. SEL stuff, yeah, that'd yeah. be good. No, yeah, yeah. 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 SEL yeah. stuff goes right in there. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else I, I, I just I, I need to commend the work of Mike and the other teachers that are doing this work. We have a handful and they're really learning what works and what doesn't work around this and how to make it the most beneficial type of programming. And um, I, I, I think the thought 
the thoughtfulness and the reflection of our teachers is gonna make sure we implement this well and implement this right as it grows. There's a lot of teachers talking about wanting to jump on and we have people like Mike and other leaders in our building that are able to be there to help them. So thank you, Mike. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. We, we currently have other schools that are calling us to come see what Mike's doing and other things too. So I mean, this Very is nice. kind of, kind of trailblazing cool. in other areas. Yeah. Next one's kind of dry here. Just to report to the board, we received two FOIA requests this month, uh, and they have been resolved, and the request has been co completed. First one is the law office of William and Cadigan. They wanted uh, contracts and agreement and related to athletics uh, services and therapy. And the second one, as you know, every three or four months, we get a FOIA from uh, the Smart Procurement, which is a company that collects governmental purchase mm -hmm. data. Uh, basically, this next one, they want the data from August to the current period at this time. So all has been resolved and, and completed. That's for the district report. Okay, great. Thank you, James. Thank you all. Um, we move on now to the consent agenda. Um, do we have any questions or comments for anything on the consent agenda? J just go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The, the, we had a major purchase or major repair in the kitchen, was it? The it was the only thing I was, I, sorry, I missed this like as I went through. I went through it again this morning. and But it was the um, the repair of the air handling. HVAC. Oh. Was it the HVAC? Yeah, that was yeah. was yeah. that just in the kitchen or was that? That's actually yeah. above the. It was, it was under a replacement of a coil. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. And what was really happening was is the kitchen, the cafeteria, uh, just to give you uh, feedback, it froze last uh, winter and what it, cause is that basically there's no air conditioning in the kitchen and it goes it gets up to about 100 degrees there and we needed to fix that right away well it's in the before. winter but no just right kidding. right <laughs> just we, we gotta get, we gotta prepare it for spring and, and, and summer sure. okay. just just a comment on the uh the 51 uh policy uh that that we reviewed last november mm -hmm. that, that the board uh, the mm -hmm. committee the policy committees recommended the board approve today so i just wanted to make sure that stands out and the last one is the ignite Club Miracle Camp. They do this every year. They're going to Michigan. It's a great event for our students. Our, our uh, two adults, our, one's a teacher, uh, Mrs. Erickson, and uh, Simon um, Sanchez is will will facilitate that trip. It's a it's a wonderful trip. They do that every year. And we have to ask. I think there was a total of 51. Don't quote me on that one. It's about approximately 50. Uh, individuals that go. So uh, we asked the board for approval because it's out of state and it's overnight. With two chaperones? Uh, Mrs. Erickson and Mr. Sanchez. Is that the uh, amount of Yes, there, there's some more, more chaperones yeah. there. Yes. Okay. All right, great. Um, then may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Jackie. Roll call, please. Peyton Howell. Yes. Jalowick. Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Pao Pong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, that motion has passed. Uh, the next item is for discussion only, and that's the selection of our new financial auditor. And that is James. Yeah. Correct? Just real quickly to update the board, uh, we've uh, interviewed three uh, financial um, companies, uh, Sam, myself, and Bruce. Uh, real thorough job. These are three respectable companies. Uh, one stood out, and um, we're, we're pretty confident right now. Bruce is uh, doing um, some recommendation checks, and we would like to bring that to the board for approval in January. If there's any questions in regards to that, this is something we do every year. We need a financial auditor. Okay, we, had, we had the last one how long? Uh, about 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Maybe we were a okay. long time, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, James. Um, then the next item on the agenda is the approval of the property tax relief application. And Bruce, that's yours. Yes. Um, this might sound a little bit familiar. This is the second year the state has um, uh, offered this grant to school districts that can apply for it. And basically, the process is you can um, abate. If you are willing to abate property taxes or a portion of property taxes, 
up to a designated formula that they um, prescribe, um, they will give you grant funds to replace a portion of that. And in our case, it's about 50% uh, or so. They would replace uh, those abated taxes with grant funds. Um, so, but the catch is, or I shouldn't say the catch, but the process is to <laughs> abate taxes for two years. Last year, you may recall, it was one year you had to abate taxes and then the grant would uh, continue on. This year, it's, it's two years um, that you would need to abate taxes. So each year, you would, it would start this year and then next year, you'd abate a portion of taxes. And then thereafter, the third year, you don't have to abate them, um, but the grant money continues and becomes part of your evidence-based funding, your state aid funding going forward. Um, the funds are available um, as long as they continue to uh, increase state uh, funding towards uh, you know, the, the, the evidence-based funding formula. Um, and it's up to $50 million that they spread across 800 and some districts across the state. So uh, the formula did change a little bit this year. Um, we rank 587 out of 851 districts. Um, so our chances of getting these funds is probably pretty slim, um, but we still think it's prudent to apply for it just in case. We don't know if these other districts ahead of us on the list are going to apply or not. So. Um, if, if folks decided not to do that, um, we would move up in, in the uh, opportunity chances to receive the funding. So um, we're recommending that we uh, participate in the program. We would apply for the uh, application um, by the end of the month, and then um, they'll notify us in January if we're eligible for the grant. So we are asking the board to take action uh, to authorize the, the uh, administration to approve or apply for the grant and submit it. Um, but that's kind of, in essence, how the program works. Is it, do we have a stand a chance this year to get anything? It, it's pretty unlikely. Mm -hmm. It's pretty unlikely, but What's we the, still think it's, it doesn't there? cost There's us no anything cost to apply, to so um, we think it's, it's still worth applying. Yeah. Well, we, we moved down on the... We moved down the, the right. formula. Too. Yeah, the formula changed this year. So we were 119 last year, right. um, and I think the uh, the now top 20 districts yeah. in the state, the fund, <laughs> right. you know, it goes by order of rank. <laughs> so the, it, it was gone. The 50 million was gone within like uh, with like the top 20 districts. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah, so it goes pretty quick. So when when we talk about rankings and we we moved with that, you mean down right 500 and whatever now. Um, that basically means our school's doing well. Right? That's very. That's correct. <laughs> right. yeah. So, I mean, it's a. It's not. A, it's I mean, a it's it's a, it's a good sign. Yeah, and and you know the intent is to re, uh, provide relief to local property taxpayers sure. because of so-called high tax rates, and and our tax rate is relatively low comparatively speaking to the right. seven high school districts in in DuPage County. So, um, it's all kind of relative. The you know what is considered a high tax rate, but um, that's kind of the formula that they use to. Um, rank you. All right. Yes. Thank you, Bruce. Any anything yes. else? Any other questions? All right. Then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the property tax relief grant application for fiscal year 2020. So moved. Second. Uh, thank you, Patty. Thank you, Mary Ann. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Team Paul Pong. Yes. Jalowick. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. All right, that motion has passed. Uh, the next item is the approval of the Fenton 2020 21 College and Career Program Guide. And Michelle, you want to say a few yeah. words on that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> on your way already, okay. Yeah, I have <laughs> folks here that are going to talk about some of the new, the new programming that we are um, proposing that we include into this curriculum guide. You all have a draft of it in front of you. Um, we have some artwork from Jessica Vigia um, that's being one of our students that's being and, um, represented on the front. And as you open it and read it, please know it seems a little bit big, but it's going to be in a PDF form. So when you actually see it online, it doesn't... Um, look as large. Um, but regardless of what it looks like, um, I, I want to talk about the content that's the most important part. So we have um, 
you know, we have a belief we want to champion innovative teaching and engage learning. So um, we're very proud of our staff. I think I, I already mentioned that, and the being trying new things and developing new programs. And we've even been thinking about our processes and how we can evolve those so we can use research based practices in our change processes. So the use of improvement science to develop change ideas and um, analyze our root cause analysis, uh, our root causes, so we can create changes that will have the most impact. Um, and we're focusing on opening up more pathways to innovation. How do we cut some of our red tape so we can get through and get new things going? Um, because our teachers are eager. <laughs> They're coming into our offices every day. Can we try this? Can we try that? And we want to support them in that work. And we also want to make sure that we're guiding them and helping them think Th think through those changes in really important ways. So our process for any changes in curriculum and instruction, we have right now three oversight types of t committees or teams. We have a school improvement team. This year it's focused on grading. Um, we've had a couple in the past, one for programming and one for grading. This year we only have a grading one. Um, we didn't really have enough um, volunteers for the other one this year, but um, we could have it again. Um, but we are doing a ton of programming e either way in career pathways. Um, so we have a career pathways committee. Both of those consist of uh, administrators and teachers. We also have our instructional leadership team, which is all of our division leaders, our assistant principal, me and Yovan. So in terms of new courses or major course revisions, most of those are happening during department um, uh, skills progressions is what we call them. We get together with our departments once a semester at least and we talk about how to align our curriculum and also any um, innovative change ideas that they want to pursue. Um, the department members then sometimes form like subcommittees or they'll walk, work directly with their division leaders in developing those change ideas and then bringing them forward. Um, Another way that some of the courses are proposed is through like the Career Pathways Committee and subcommittees from that. Um, after each of those skills progression meetings, we meet with the counseling team, especially for any of those meetings that big change ideas are coming, like our change to integrated math. And our counselors are great. They give us really important global perspective. They're the only other ones in the building besides administrators that have to see the big picture. They have to be able to explain every aspect of our programming to students and parents, so they have a lot of great insight. So we meet with them after each one of our skills progressions where we do develop any new change ideas. So that's kind of our, our process in a nutshell. So we're gonna talk about all of our new programs. I'm gonna start with um, English 4. Um, I was making sure Abra came back. Um, but Abra Millman and Mike Mitchell have been piloting this course. We talked about it a little bit last year. And they are phenomenal. Um, talk about innovators. Abra Millman works with project-based project learning in such a significant way. Our students are exhibiting their work in really authentic ways very often in all, many of her classes. And Mike Mitchell has been working with assessment practices heavily for years now. And so we thought the combination of them working together on this pilot was great, and it has been. So I'm excited to hear them talk about English 4 and um, for you to hear about English 4 from them. Um, yeah, so we started English Board. We probably started talking about it maybe six years ago, I think. It's been in the works for a while. Yeah, yeah so it's very sure. well considered. And um, a lot of the reasons why it, it was brought to our attention is because the way that our senior English has been set up has been a series of electives outside of the AP courses. And while a lot of those have been very vigorous, we've heard from our counseling department that some colleges had some questions about some of the titles on the transcripts and whether or not they were really preparing the students for um, freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. So so in designing the English 4 class, there are a number of uh, things that we wanted to make sure uh, that there, there would be some key components with that, um, such as college career readiness, it would be inquiry-based, uh, leader-led learning, personalized learning, uh, focusing on a lot of rhetorical skills, exposing them to different types of research methodologies, qualitative as well as quantitative. Um, 
and ultimately a, a big, huge project with a public display of their knowledge and their research. And the way that we've kind of designed the class for the first semester is to give them a number of different opportunities to kind of do those types of projects on a very small skill, uh, scale, I should say, and then later in the second semester, they would be able to do this on a much bigger, large scale for a much bigger, larger audience. So that's kind of looking forward uh, to next semester. Um, we can only really talk at, at, with any kind of real genuine um, experience with first semester, uh, trying a lot of new things. Um, we've done a couple of different surveys and talking to students as well. And some of the things that they've uh, told us is that um, the class has been very active in their learning. Uh, that they've been learning from their mistakes. I can say that I've definitely been learning from mine as well. There are things I will mm -hmm. do differently next year. Um, they, like, they like doing a lot of the, uh, the discussions and that kind of thing, and they find the various different types of qualitative and uh, quantitative uh, research methodologies interesting. We've, been, we've just been looking at studies. Some of them have done some very small scale kinds of research projects. We have some examples here that Abra will show you as well, but um, I had one student that did a portraiture um, qualitative research assignment where she was showing students pictures, uh, like different images, and having them kind of respond, and she was recording their narratives to ultimately define or to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? And got some really interesting uh, responses from that, and that's, that's a college level type of research project that she did, mm -hmm. and I can't wait to see what this young lady is going to do next semester already. So I don't know, you probably yeah. want to talk a little bit about, about that project Yeah, as well. sure. So I think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these skills and then um, we're sort of bridging it with the, the, the overarching question of identity and how they see themselves in terms of how they're going to apply and function within the world. And so we read Frankenstein. That was <laughs> not much, that didn't, that was a stinker. But we had some, <laughs> there was some really great content that came out of that in terms of discussion and that was the driving question mm -hmm. of what does it mean to be human and I had this student who I had in sophomore year in a, su a support class who struggled a lot in English and I have her right now in English 4 and she decided that what makes us human is aesthetics and beauty and she did all this research about different types of beauty practices around the world and different cultures and then she um, is an AP art, uh, art student and so she decided to do her research project using her favorite medium. So she created these different pieces and then gave a presentation where she accurately orally cited all of the research that she had used from academic peer-reviewed journals to connect it to the work that she created. And it's the most confident I've seen this young lady in terms of as a student. And she had certainly a lot of ownership over her product. And I just felt like that was a very authentic learning experience. And this is an example of what we'd like to keep doing with English for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would be, uh, it would be a huge mistake to not mention the other members of our team that have been working with yeah. us um, for the last year or so. Uh, Mr. Oakson, Tony Oakson, um, Ms. Emily Paydon, as well as... Um, Rebecca Norris. Yes, Rebecca Norris. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great team. We've been doing some really interesting creative uh, things and we will definitely do things differently as we move forward uh, because we are learning from our mistakes mm -hmm. as our students are as well. So and we're also just another piggyback on what uh, Mr. Braga was saying. We're oh, sure. really looking forward to applying blended learning to spring semester mm -hmm. and seeing how that's going to work with our seniors and encouraging them to go out into their community to research and outside of the library. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Very nice. Okay, cool. This group, um, just to kind of frame how exceptional their work is, we we articulate with District 2 and 7, but we also articulate um, up. So we, we had a recent articulation, Kate Ward and I, with um, the College of DuPage, and we were telling them about our new course and the competencies that we expected our students to be able to master by the end of that course. And they said it clearly aligned um, with their competencies that they're working on with their students. So we were really um, 
kind of geeked out about that. <laughs> we're like, they're like, that's good college level work. So um, we were excited to hear that we're in the we're on the right direction. Um, in this team, I also I think it's important. Kate Ward, as their division leader, has helped pull this team together and support them through this work. That's a heavy lift and it takes a lot of reflection to make sure it's done well and right. And she's done a phenomenal job of leading them. So. Thank you for you guys, and thank you for presenting. Um, our, our next course is about math one and two. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, yeah. so then seniors, they have to take four years of English. Correct. So this is their fourth year of English. So if they yeah. wanted to take AP English literature, that's in addition to no, English no, no. form? If, if they want to take, I guess their senior year, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but senior their senior, if they want to take AP English four, they would still have that option. Okay, um, instead of option. English instead 4. Of, Got it. Okay. Um, this would be in place of some of the other electives that they had options for in the past, such as you know 20th century as well as Britain. We, we, we've we taught Are you willing to give them up yeah. to this? Yeah. That is the plan. They're giving up <laughs> lifestyles and literature, 20th century lit, Brit lit, film and media, one and two, and I did fail to put on sci-fi sci yeah. sci sci um, science fiction so I'm sorry about that but that, I'm just try clarifying that for you all now Th that would be one other course that will be archived um, and I've that. been teaching seniors for 10 years now and I think one of the reasons I'm excited about this new format is that it's been only a semester and you mm -hmm. just sort of you kind of are just getting your momentum Mm -hmm. And so, especially when you're trying to do big stuff, you know, when you're really trying to dig in and get them to produce something that is at a larger scale, mm -hmm. I think having the full year is going to make a big difference in terms oh, of sure. preparing them for, well, for I, what's beyond. I think, sure. the, I think the project that we did earlier this semester, the What Does It Mean to Be Human, really kind of helped me tap into, it was almost like a, like a large scale learner profile uh, yeah. project mm -hmm. where I could really kind of see what their interests are. And they're and in talking with some of the students for next semester, they're already jazzed about what kind of project they can do next. Um, I, have, I have a lot of computer yeah, guys that I, you know, they're talking code. I have no idea what they're talking about, <laughs> but um, they're really interested in the difference between um, uh, what is it, artificial intelligence and human intelligence, and you know they talk a lot. Of, they talked a lot about that. Well, that's the biggest difference, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of that question. And they want to try to um, explore more of that next semester and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's going to be it's a really interesting class. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So mm -hmm. Me too. Rigor, relevance, and relationships. Relationship. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's Thanks give them another hand. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks again for your work. Um, okay, math one and two, um, Mr. Brian Augustine is going to come and talk to us about this work within math. They're making a significant transition from a typical algebra, geometry, algebra two sequence to an integrated mathematics approach. So he's going to come and talk to you about um, the work that we've been doing along those lines. Thanks. Hello, how are you guys? How are you guys? <laughs> This is actually my first time actually meeting with you guys since the last time. So that's a good. So I'm a little nervous here. Um, so the reason is, our, what is our why in terms of going into the integrated mathematics? That is the biggest question that we have here. So our decision to shift from a traditional math curriculum to an integrated approach reflects our commitment to our offering our students a program that meets their individual needs through applied mathematics. Our program provides students opportunities to focus on the developmental conceptual understanding and how the, the disciplines within mathematics are intertwined. Instead of having separate courses for algebra and geometry, this integrated approach presents math topics sequenced in ways that help students to see the connections, allowing them for, to be able to connect the dots between each of these specific courses that used to in, be in silos. An integrated curriculum provides students the ability and opportunity to investigate other topics such as functions, probability, statistics, trig, and data analysis. Also, this enables this 
this also, this change will highlight skills such as collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, innovation, as well as communication, which is highly valued and what we're gonna teach our students to do. So what we're requesting is that, or what we're looking to implement next year is going from the standard algebra course and going into the integrated math one, and for our geometry course, going to the integrated math two for our incoming freshmen. Could you say that one more time? So what we're gonna do is look at um, changing our Algebra one curriculum to an integrated Math one curriculum, okay. and our Geometry into our integrated Math two program. In the end, we'll want to implement Math three. At this particular time, the Math three class is not quite ready. The curriculum, we're not, we're not quite ready in terms of implementation. So what will remain the same are our accelerated Geometry classes, as well as our accelerated Algebra two classes. Next year, this time, we'll be talking about the implementation of Math 3, which will replace Algebra 2. Okay. But at this particular time, it's not quite ready. And we didn't want to go and make that jump until we were completely sure. What, you can, what I can tell you in terms of the implementation phase, our math teachers, our Math 1 teachers, and I call them Math 1 teachers, even though they're still Algebra 1 teachers, have started to implement Math 1 concepts within the current curriculum. They've been piloting this this year, as well as our Math 2 um, teachers. So we are starting to make that transition now with the existing names, so that next year we could hit the ground running in a fully vetted and implemented Math 1 and 2 curriculum. And Brian, our students are doing well in this new program? What's going to end up happening is we're going to be really focusing and honing in on those specific foundational skills in Math 1 and Math 2, where students are going to have multiple exposure to conceptual um, content knowledge that they're going to see multiple times. Instead of it being taught once, it's going to be seen multiple times and give students a deeper understanding of the math concepts. Now, in terms of onboarding this, mm -hmm. um, you know, so so in terms of timing, the the, the uh, executing changes, mm -hmm. right, and, and then like the guidance counselors that have that have to work with uh, the students, right, to mm -hmm. schedule and uh, articulate the the changes. Mm -hmm. are, are we giving them a little bit of training, some time, and you know, is that all? I'm sure it's all coordinated, but how does that work? Well, the teachers themselves have been involved in this for at least a couple of years. Um, they couldn't implement this without designing their um, competencies in a really deliberate manner to be able to execute a curriculum such as this. Um, throughout the process, we've been meeting with the counselors. I think we had a meeting back in October when we had our first skills progression, and then we talked again with them just before um, the curriculum guide will be published so they can ask questions, understand the why, under, and, and be able to give us feedback on like global implications. So um, their feedback's always really helpful. Um, and then also monitoring this and how effective it is. It, you know, what's the, what's the period of time? Is it, you know, is, is it basically this going forward and then? Yeah, I mean, what we're hoping to see is that in our student achievement data is where we see the best results. I mean, typically we've had a student go to algebra take a year off of algebra, and then go back into an algebra two course with a huge gap in learning, and that's, there's really no geometry, or very little, if any geometry in our SAT assessment. So to have this ongoing um, spiraled curriculum with algebra concepts over three years, we're really hoping to see a great benefit to our students. The idea behind math one and two and uh, math, if you go back, so I used to be the math division head at Prospect, and so we did a lot of research around this. Uh, the entire state of Colorado had gone to integrated math, but students weren't performing on the ACT, so they went away from it. Hersey High School did the same thing. They went to integrated math, but they didn't like the performance on the ACT because they had a lot of geometry. 
And uh, so if you go back to the historical idea, only two years of math were usually taken by students, and so they put geometry second because it was the hardest. And that's the only reason that it was second. <laughs> and so then when, it, when it, we started adding math to, you know, well, we need a third year of math, and we need a fourth year of math, they're just like, well, just leave the geometry second, and then we'll teach algebra again, you know, and we'll teach a third, and then we'll teach something fourth. So that's kind of how it. So when we get into integrated, now we're spiraling all of those skills, and the students continue to touch on them over and over again. It just happens to be also that the SAT is called the heart of algebra. That's the main pur purpose mm -hmm. of it. And so when you're constantly doing algebra, the students aren't losing that skill set. So, so you don't get this gap year, and now we have to reteach them all algebra again, and then teach them a little bit more of the concepts. We're teaching this the whole time that they're going and so when they get to that junior year they really have a good understanding of algebra and they have some geometry concepts that go around it so when that's why we've been looking at integrated math for about two or three years. I mean when I walked in the door Michelle and I started talking about it and we're really at that point point. and again it's taken us this long because we want teachers to feel comfortable with it they have to trust the process and where they are and now they're finally at that point where they're like yep this is something that we really need for our students so to answer your question Jack yeah they see some successes as they continue to grow and we'll still see some more successes as we go forward and again, we're not an SAT school, so that doesn't necessarily, that's not, but we're definitely going to see growth in that area too because they're going to really attack the heart of algebra as we go forward. So. You said we're not an SAT school? We're not right, we're not an SAT school. Well, because there are schools out there that claim that they're SAT schools. Like, they're going to prepare their kids for the SAT, and they're going to get a lot. We, we don't do that. We're, 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 we're teaching the whole school. We have great fine arts. Yeah. We have all these other great things that we're doing for our kids, so that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So does this, um, like, we have like our entry math, you know, our basic math, and, and every, everybody needs math in high school. And, okay, and then we had an honors track. How, how is, does this connect with like? As Kansas of right, right now, now um, we actually had um, more than um, just a basic and a honors. We had, yeah. we had so this true. actually collapsed the lower <laughs> and proving the rigor so all students will enter into um, math one, and if they've already displayed competency, or we can measure that competency in, in collaboration with our um, feeder schools, they can take um, a higher level class. So we'll still have accelerated at this point. Um, yeah, there's accelerated courses that are still going to be offered at this point. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, if a student has mastered math one, should they just go into math two? <laughs> you know, and, and the sequence of that. But we aren't quite uh, um, there. We want to just get the basic level down and ready. <laughs> so. Theoretically, also that it, it actually, math is the hardest to actually accelerate students through it and to get them to an AP course at any level. It's a little bit easier in, uh, in your Englishes and in your, in your social studies as students read, depending upon where they are. Math is really, really sequential in those ideas. And by having this math integrated, we can really see students accelerate and then we can move them uh, to this higher level. We get, gives us more kind of entry points into the accelerated and gets more kids into the AP program towards the end really is kind of yeah. the idea. Now that's, again, our goal is to get them math and really get them strong in their math and their critical thinking skills and move forward. But that'll be the That'll kind of, it's kind of we're shooting for the moon. If we don't get there, we're going to wind up amongst the stars anyway. So this will be awesome for our kids. But ho hopefully we're going to get a bunch of kids that are going to wind up in AP as well that normally we wouldn't have even been able to, to touch and get to that point. So. Okay. Okay. So, so just so I understand right, so repeating the, the concepts is at the core of the, really uh, of this. It's just the, the, the repetition rather than just sit and get well, it's, and, it, by, by teaching yeah, I mean, the concept once. Well, not yeah, repeating, it's a, it's spiraling. A, it's it's spiraling. spiraling. Yeah. So every time it's repeated, it's repeated with a higher conceptual understanding. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then the actual, as Brian mentioned, the actual integration of math concepts um, allows for higher level thinking um, because you're not just learning isolated skills in a silo, you're integrating them alongside of other mathematical concepts, um, creating more um, a higher level thinking. Complexity. Yeah. It's going to be much more complex as we move into math two and math three. Mm -hmm. It'll be revisited. Rigor. However, it's going to be focusing on the specific rigor, but meeting the students where they're currently at at the beginning is what we okay. want to focus on first and then guide them through and provide more challenges for them as they move into Math 2 and Math 3. Eventually, just like Yovan had said, is for the most part, our students will go into AP classes. In the end, our goal is for our students to go into Calc 3 
and that's a class that's not there yet. Um, that's, that class is a college level class that's beyond AP. So it's a third year differential functions mathematics class that's we're going to be bringing to our students, enabling our students because of this program. Yeah. Not next year. No, it's the year after. Year. We'll give you two years. Next year. You know, I mean, I wish I could. I, I, we, we have our math one and our algebra current algebra teachers and geometry teachers that are working this, and they really believe in it. We would have had them come tonight. They already presented to districts two and seven on this. We said that's enough presenting. Um, we'll go ahead and let Brian cut, uh, get some face time with you guys. But they um, really um, are pretty passionate about the fact that these students are going to master this and they're going to make sure that they master this and um, they're going to make sure they meet students where they're at and um, if they whatever they need to get there is what they're going to provide they're amazing I, I, I'm going to bring them and talk to you one time yeah for <laughs> um, them. They're, I, they're great. They, they are incredible yeah. the math one and two um, group oh, have math. been trailblazers in terms of the the, the uh, curriculum development they're also blending like they're a group that should be here talking about blending because they were one of those groups that took the chance and took the risk to move forward to take a look at what could we do in terms of providing our students with direct contact, individualized supports, while still at the same time helping our students that are at the accelerated track where they're, they're at level. So Brian, thank you for jumping into the leadership role on this project that's been ongoing. He's done a really nice job of, of leading it forward from here. So um, that was math. Thank you, Brian, again. Um, what else do we have? Um, physiology of exercise. Mr. Crando's very sick, so I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to make it brief. Um, but I'll try and give you the... the the bullet points on it. So currently students take um, a freshman PE, a sophomore PE, and then they can take these a variety of electives. So what they want to do um, in our PE department's been discussing this for a year and a half, two years. Um, it's a little nerve-wracking because it's like, how do you figure out the facilities for this and um, all of that, but they, they do feel that allowing students choice in what they do um, is going to engage them better in their physical education courses. So every six to nine weeks, students will have the opportunity to choose what activity they want to participate in. Wellness and fitness can manifest in a lot of different ways. Forcing all students into a team sport, or although they're great, I was a team sport girl, right? But there's a lot of different ways that students can display competency in physical education and wellness. So they want to provide students the choices in which they can display those competencies throughout the school year. So they're proposing um, that they go to a, um, it's called um, Physiology of Exercise 10, 11, 12. All sophomores through seniors will actually be in combined grade level courses and choosing every six to nine weeks. Um, they have developed competencies around goal setting, fitness planning, teamwork, healthy lifestyle choices. Um, so we really think that allowing them this ownership in their learning and Pairing that with the competencies will help them become better goal setters and take more ownership of their learning. Um, yeah, I think that covers it all with Choice PE. Okay. Any questions about that? Good job, Mr. Crane. Okay. <laughs> I should have talked very low. <laughs> um, AP Computer Science A, Mr. Barago, I don't think he realized I put his name on this one, but um, he um, and I have been talking, um, actually more recently, we had the Hour of Code just a couple weeks ago, and it was phenomenal, and I think our kids spoke volumes about 
their attendance in our hour of code, we need to offer more um, computer science courses. So um, although we're still taking some really deliberate efforts within Career Pathways, um, we have identified, um, as we talked about last time, computer and information technology as our priority of developing a pathway. Um, this isn't a full-on pathway, but it's a, another addition into our pathway. So our students currently have the opportunity to take AP Computer Science Principles. This would be another AP Computer Science course for them to take. Um, the Computer Science A um, focuses more on the explicit use of JavaScript, so it gets into the complexities of coding, whereas the principles is an overview of your computer science um, principles. So these are your students who really want to code. <laughs> um, and so there'll be an option for them. They might decide to take both, or they might decide one or the other. So we'll see how this one plays out, but we definitely um, felt we needed to provide that option um, for them. So. Um, that is all the new course proposals. Um, I want to talk to you about a couple significant um, course, like program changes. Oh, I have it. He doesn't. Um, so, in your packet, the art program has um, done some work. The teachers in there have decided that it's really important that um, they combine some of their coursework. So they don't actually lose students from their programming. So they used to run cartooning and computer art and drawing and painting and ceramics and all these separate courses. And they've been working on this consolidation for a couple years. Um, but now they have um, have their three full pathways developed in the uh, visual arts, which is really nice. So they have a photo one, photo two, AP photo, a 2D art one, 2D art two, AP 2D art, and a 3D art um, one, two, and AP, um, with one standalone as an AP history for students who want to take an elective in that visual arts. And it also is a great cross-curricular option. Um, so there, the actual new course involved in that that didn't exist before in here is actually photo two. So that is being proposed to complete the pathway or complete the program of study. Okay. Career internship course um, is undergoing a major revision. I actually just got back from another school. Um, this afternoon we went to visit um, Maine Township to see how they're working through their career internship programming. And we know that what we have to do is provide more students um, this opportunity and provide them more on-site time with employers. So we're looking to see how to build our career internship program, which currently runs one period a day, to up to three periods a day. So we have some students that leave our building in the morning or afternoon every day currently to go to the Technology Center of DuPage, TCD, where they learn nursing or um, PLTW or um, cosmetology, a great deal of different um, activities. So, so but they don't cover every career. <laughs> There's thousands of them. So for students who are ready for an intense and active, authentic experience in a work site, they have a passion for what they want to do, we want to work directly with them to personalize their experience and give them on-site experiences on the job. So that's why we're looking to expand and um, recreate our career internship experience. The other thing by, uh, that will happen by extending the time period from um, one period to multiple periods is the, um, the ability to provide more direct instruction on how to be successful in those settings, right? So what are those SEL skills that they're gonna need to um, display? How, do, how can they reflect on what they're doing and how, that they, how they can get better? So having a forum and a place for that in their day with a teacher, um, we think is gonna be really helpful for them to be successful. Any questions about career internship? That's directly out of our career pathways work as well. So we have a subcommittee. It's me, Eric, um, Rich Weiss, and um, Ron Janik. So um, they came. They, they were with me at Maine West this um, afternoon as well. Could, does does it have to go through TCD? Could we like do? Well, we're not doing apprenticeships. Or we're not, we're doing, not doing it through TCD. TCD. This is our own programming that TCD doesn't provide. So we can give much more individualized experiences to students. It's just our ability to build those partnerships with businesses. Sometimes when we say they're only going to be there for 35 minutes, they're like, eh. 
You know, like, <laughs> okay, how are we going to do that? Um, so we do think that having some extended time periods available to our students might help um, us develop even stronger partnerships with businesses as well. Um, there's two more major programming. Um, consumer education requirement. We currently run a number of courses that count for consumer education. It's mandated by the state that we provide consumer education, and it's good. Like, students need to know how to live and have a checkbook and, um, <laughs> and manage their life, right? Um, so we've had um, consumer education, um, AP macroeconomics, and a couple of our ESL, and... Um, special ed courses count for it. And we also had a, a course called Independent Living that counted for that. As we analyzed the curriculum, we, and the, the teachers aligned it so well that they became very, very close in courses. So we're just um, putting it um, all back into business. Um, and we're going to archive the Independent Living course, and we're going to just run the consumer education course. Then the program, um, okay, driver's education. <laughs> We're gonna be applying for a waiver from the state. Um, Downers currently applies for this waiver, so they gave us the paperwork on how to do it. Um, but and we are feeling pretty confident it'll go through. But we want to provide driver's education for a whole semester. There is a certain amount of hour requirement that we have to engage students in driver's education. Um, we want to fulfill that and extend that. Um, we want to incorporate more authentic safety experiences for them. We want to bring in our police officers. We want to really engage our community in what safety looks like for our students. And, um, provide a more comprehensive experience around um, driving and safety for our students. So we want to replace one semester, which we currently replace nine weeks of a P sophomore PE. We want to replace the entire semester um, of, a, sorry, a 10th grade PE course um, for them to take a 16-week driver's ed course. In that, that we're eliminating? PE. Just regular PE, class. yeah. Okay. So instead of, they'll miss nine more weeks of PE and get nine more weeks of um, driving, training. driving and safety. safety. So safety, and we're looking into CPR being provided to every one of our students. So does that, is that gonna, so I, I don't know if this was, uh, was ever a feedback to, to, to the driver's ed program, but there'd been some problems with waiting periods or kids registering and having to wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, does that, does that ever, was that ever, um, does this help in expanding access to it then, in a way, you know, as far as oh, enrollment? Kids, all for drivers, kids, for drivers, all of our kids yeah. have, have access to it pretty much. I don't, it's expansion, but all of our, our students, usually yeah. their sophomore year, have access to Okay. Are you talking about behind the wheel? Yeah, the wheel. Is it yeah. behind the wheel? I, yeah. We haven't looked at that to, okay. to actually have them drive during the day, um, but that could be something that we would take a look at that would give them some more time during the day to do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, currently all of our students have to, as as James right. said, they have to have driver's education, and we provide that right now. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's. I think you're right. Is it behind the wheel? Behind the wheel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hours our teachers, teachers have been asking for more time to really get beyond the surface level of these concepts um, for a while now. So I think they're really excited to be able to actually dive deeper into and, and ensure the students really understand these concepts. Um, Will it getting insurance rates for them? I hope. <laughs> but I don't know. And the <laughs> but I, I can't, I can't parents, speak to that. We are going to be noncommittal for that, just yeah. so you understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So then there's a variety of name changes. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. They're for a variety of reasons, mostly because the state changes what their um, course names are, so then we match them, or they've changed some mandates around certain things. So um, I, I put a few of them on here. Um, so, for instance, we had courses named Chefs, Mini Restaurants, Foreign Foods. Well, 
um, we want to align that with the National Association standards like Culinary 1, Culinary 2, Culinary 3. It's more career focused. It's, um, it, it helps us create an actual program of study that can, I think I mentioned last time, be funded through like Perkins um, and our state <laughs> and um, some of our other funding sources. So um, some of that. And a lot of it has to do with career readiness efforts. Like earth science is becoming geoscience. Geoscience has more... Um, applications and careers than just a basic earth science. So um, you'll, you'll see a few things like that. Native speakers, we're calling it heritage speakers. That's a national association type of standard. They're not calling it native, they're calling it heritage. Um, and, um, oh yeah, like a state regulation around transition to STEM. So the Post-Secondary Workforce Act that I talk about a lot um, also is overseeing the transition math course, that course that students can take before they enter college, um, so they don't have to go um, into a remedial college course. Um, they called it transition to STEM last year, now they're like, okay, we're gonna call it college algebra, so we just keep going with the flow and changing our name along with them. <laughs> so um, that's where we're at. Um, the guide itself is set up a little bit differently. We actually, after the general studies, put in all of the career um, exploration areas that we've defined as a career pathways team. So you won't necessarily see like an applied tech department or family consumer science department or um, business department. You will see all of the elective courses, including elective courses from the core areas in each of the career areas. So it, it's, it's an awareness tool for um, families and for um, students to better understand what are these different careers and what are the courses that can relate to those. So we're pretty excited about that. Thanks for um, <laughs> listening to all of our work. I know it's a lot, um, but we, we're making great changes and um, really important ones that our teachers are spearheading and I think our leaders have done an outstanding job of supporting them and that's just what we wanna do. So we hope that they continue to innovate and thanks for supporting us. So I am making a recommendation and hoping that you will support um, the archival of last year's college and career program guide and the approval of um, this new 2021 program guide with the changes as presented. Great job, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so may I have a motion for the Board of Education uh, archive the 2019-2020 College and Career Program Guide and approve the 2020-2021 Program Guide with the changes as presented. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Team Paul Pong? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Um, motion has passed. Thank you. Uh, and the next item is the disposal of equipment. And, Jim, I think that is yours. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> I'll speak briefly to this. Um, there are some drones that have been sitting in storage for quite some time. Uh, the interesting, we did a little research on some of these. Um, we're not quite certain when they were purchased, but it's a large bass drum and a set of timpani. The timpani, the mechanism on the timpani dates back to the early 40s. So we're, we're not really sure exactly how old these things are, but they've been taking up storage space and uh, we found somebody that's willing to take them away because they're very heavy and would be difficult to ship. And they're antique, so they're worth, how much do we need for the construction? <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. Throw the right. shot. <laughs> Every dollar helps. Dang. Yeah. We need millions <laughs> are we, from are what they, I saw. Just, are they making a donation to us? Right? Yeah, and, and we think we found a uh, uh, actually a community band that's starting up that needs some, some instruments. It's oh, a good. former good band talks. director from uh, one of the nearby schools, I'm not too sure where it is, but uh, it's looking for some drums, and they're willing to come pick them up and leave our storage area so we can use it. So, okay. Very good. Yeah. Good, good. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the disposal 
of the attached uh, list of all obsolete musical e equipment. So moved. Second. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Marianne. Roll call, please. Peyton Howell? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Paul Pong? Yes. Jalwick? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Motion is passed. Now we move on to the committee reports. Um, Bensonville Community Foundation. Uh, we, had, Kit, we didn't Kit. have a meeting. So it was the, there was no meeting this, this past uh, month. So. so upcoming. So we'll have something next time. Yeah, we'll have something next time. Okay, thanks. Finance Committee. Um, we are the only th unless you know anything, Marianne. The only thing is is no. the upcoming finance committee meeting regarding the uh, facilities, and right. that and that'll be on the 29th. The 29th, right before the board meeting, 6 p.m. Kind of a uh, our January? normal of January 28th. Okay. Uh, January 28th is our regular board meeting. 6 p.m. We'll have the facility finance committee. Uh, it's a one agenda topic. It will be the draft, as Alan was stating earlier. Uh, so we could roll up our sleeve, really dive into their data, their findings, the photos, and so forth. So we encourage everyone to attend. So we'll do that at, at 6. At 6 o'clock. Okay. 6 o'clock, yeah. And you also heard, just a heads up, too, the final assessment will be submitted in February. We're going to follow that same format, 6 p.m., uh, right before the board meeting. So if you could just mark your calendar, there'll be an invite for that. Tuesday, because I think there's a band oh, okay. concert that day. So I want to Tuesday. Double check your number. Yeah. Okay. All right. Tuesday, the 28th. Yes. Of January versus, or is that February you're talking? February. February. Oh. 29th is January. Yeah. Okay. I, I will clarify that on an email. Thank you. Thank okay. yeah. you. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> ISB delegate. Um, in general, the votes when is discussed for all those items that were on the resolutions uh, committee mm -hmm. report. And that's the only other item. Uh, Lend. There was no meeting. There was nothing. Ned, yeah, Ned Sec. Um, uh, I, I did attend that meeting. And um, something interesting that they are across the state shorthanded uh, paraprofessionals. So if you know anybody who has at least two years of a college education, 60 credit hours, um, high school graduation um, to uh, d high school diploma, there is a certification course that they can take to become a parapro. So they are in need of parapros um, across the state. And that they have an increase, um, private placement right now of 62 individuals, and there's an increase of 10, and they're expecting um, even more now. So 62 is like a, is at an all-time high of uh, individually placed um, special needs individuals. And they did some really cool, um, the McKinsey Project, where they just are integrating special needs kids into the regular classroom and just how the transition of some of these kids, it was, it was really cool. That wasn't the McKinsey Project, that was something else. But um, they did do a presentation on that so is, is, is it a, like a concerted effort to mainstream yes yeah and that's, and that's they have to meet certain criteria of course but there was an individual in Bensonville who ended up at Lincoln and then now he's back in the Bensonville schools and how he has thrived Correct. with that too Correct. I have a question on that for one of you more professional people um, no 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 these guys hmm. When you have special needs, I understand there's different levels of special needs. Is there, and that's based on the recommendation, the 504 and the whatever the other. I, I, right. I, I, let me try to answer that real quick, and I'm going to give it to Michelle and yeah, Sam and Yovan. Right. right. So real quick, <laughs> it, <laughs> it really depends what we could offer at the school district. Okay. Some of the severe um, disabilities. Correct really specialize at NEDSEC and they have the facilities and they have the professionals there at their at their place. They, but they ours are not mainstream at all, are they? Some are. Some of our kids are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always, every single student has an individualized plan. Okay. So 
they will individualize to what extent they're in their least restrictive environment. So okay. mainstream um, is the term that used to be used for that. But um, I know that, <laughs> no, that's okay. That um, they, every student, that's kind of like the goal in the law is to try and figure out how to ensure right. that they have access to that least okay. restrictive environment. So a lot of our students that are here in the NETSEC program, they have access to some of our um, courses and yeah. our students that aren't in the NETSEC courses, most of them are in a general education setting for at least a certain portion of their day. Um, so there's, I don't know if any of our students outside of NETSEC programming that are 100%, I don't think any of them are 100% in special ed. Okay. Um, I know there, there's no, Yeah, There might no be one, one, like for example, uh, um, the school for the deaf. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if we have, a, I think we had a student a, a year ago where it's completely at that location. Okay. All right. Um, and then also we had an equity audit recently. Does that does that play a role in what what we the ROE well? audit? Yeah. It was the ROE audit? Oh, it? Sure. The equity audit. Right. The question. That's um, that would be part of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know with the Allen and the facilities looking at disability, uh, accessibility, all those things probably play a role in that endeavor. So. Yes. Yep. Pretty holistic. So one of the big problems they have with like sharing the, the nets at classes and then and also trying to provide them less least restrictive classes um, is the transportation and the loss of, of classroom time. Correct. Mm. So they try do try to get them into the least restrictive classes more quickly. What, what is our student body percentage on that? There's 13 um, in, uh, districts that feed into NETSEC. Yeah. Uh, I believe we have approximately 26 in that program. That's that program. We're not the biggest. I believe Bensonville two is the biggest. Mm -hmm. Starts at that young level. And I, did, I mentioned the McKinsey project. It's actually a project for uh, third to twelfth grade um, special ed kids mm -hmm. who um, who want to get into theater and to help them to get into to theater to get on to get on the stage to develop friendships and relationships and do stuff outside of the classroom and so there's um, there it's something that they're trying to offer and they'll be offering it I think it'll be in one of the Roselle the Roselle junior high is where they're going to do this so they need help with transportation from the districts on that that's your cue okay <laughs> okay thanks <laughs> All right, uh, the next one, policy committee. We just had a policy committee meeting, so there's nothing there. Um, next board meeting, new business. James, do you, do you have anything? Uh, or, I just wanted to bring something light. I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of uh, the, the census 2020 yes. yeah, that's, that's among us. And... Um, and I'm pretty sure, based on feedback from James, we've, we've been discussing it uh, with uh, communication. And so it's, we're being coordinated uh, through, uh, you know, city facilities, city government, local government, uh, our other district feeder schools. Um, the one thing that I wanted to make sure is, I think, kind of put a weight on it and, and maybe some urgency on it. Um, and I think three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I started, you know, really paying attention to more reading up on it and um, you know just some things that I will bring to light is uh, so for example um, so this is the biggest event of the summer for schools I provided you guys um, from the National Associ uh, Education Association um, just how the census 2020 could make or break a public school system um, there's there's basically funding a state, and uh, financially speaking, uh, I think we're in uh, very good shape because of our leadership, uh, but at the same time, we want, to, we want to keep going with it and hedge anything that comes up. Uh, and we know we've got some challenges possibly coming up. So um, there's $800 billion on the line, and you know it, we're, we want to look get some of that. Um, now, what... What are some challenges here and, and why maybe it's important with, with our school specifically? So 60% um, of our population, around 6% is Latino, Hispanic. Um, the census 2020 really, um, in, in essence, could, could discourage some of our 
population to not take the census, but it really makes a difference that every person is counted um, so that we are represented properly, um, you know, along with everybody else uh, in other districts and other uh, education systems. So uh, what I'm asking for is just uh, for us to do our part to raise awareness, communicate, uh, do some outreach, um, really engage um, the community that we, we are in, um, you know, to make sure that the, the information is accurate, the facts are out, and that um, it, it is important. It is really important. So that's all I wanted to, to say. And I, I don't know if, um, you know, in terms of us, what, what we do, or I would, I would leave it up to our board to look at it, but I wanted to put it on our radar. Just to pick it back to and what, what yeah. Kit was saying, there's uh, obviously the, the, all the manips, uh, manips, oh my goodness, the villages, <laughs> let's just say the villages, the villages, yes. I'll give up, uh, <laughs> is that there's a task force that's going on in regards to it. It's, it's very simple. We want everyone counted. Why? Because of federal funding. Mm -hmm. In particular, special ed is one, one of the biggest ones. Um, so we're, we're in collaboration with the villages, okay? And there's a task for being formed um, in communication with the superintendents, uh, both two and seven. And how can we raise awareness and make sure everyone participates? As we all know, it comes in three forms. You could do it online, you could do it by phone, or you could do it by mail. So as when is the big day? March. Uh, um, and I believe the last day would be April is uh, April 1st is uh, I think census day so there's gonna be a lot of movement coming uh, the January of 2020 but once again it's the funding we want to capture that so does the villages so does the different taxing bodies so we're m making a movement forward um, spoke to Rick earlier and we're gonna try to collaborate how could we get the messaging in different languages and so forth should we have a census evening here at, at Fenton and so forth, or at District 2, or at the churches, or at the fire, mm -hmm. fireplace. Mm -hmm. Or all so. of them. Or all of them. Or yeah. all of them. To make sure yeah. they're all Very good. Yeah. And the, the one thing that um, I think would, would, would uh, help is um, some of the things that uh, we need to watch out for is, you know, moms and the children, too. So all the, the children in the household uh, should be counted. Um, also, how to handle a census employee that comes to your door knocking to 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 ask for uh, you know to do the survey so those are just some things like you know picturing uh, parents of our immigrant kids mm -hmm. those things how do we prepare them to make sure that they're, they're they feel safe and, yeah. and not slamming the door and, yeah. <laughs> you know uh, so those things would, would be uh, I think impactful so this is not mandatory for them to do. It benefits everyone if they do do that, but th they can really slam the door. Well, it's th government. This one option, it yeah. 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 It's, it's, as we know, it's part of the Constitution. Right. Um, um, and what's really nice is the questions are on 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 the website. The ten right. questions are there. Right. It's right there, so we could fuck. Hey, look, these are the questions to, that School they will fill ask. It out and yeah. Yeah. Submit it. Yeah. And then yeah. to piggyback on what's already been said, D at uh, the ISB. To emphasize that that uh, you know part of the um, you know as far as with the parameters within the school districts that are in DuPage is um, they are encouraging everyone to take part in the census as much as possible for that purpose of school funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is their stance and that's what their recommendation is moving forward to all of the school <coughs> school districts. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thanks, Kit. Right. And as we know, our next board meeting is January 29th. So now we go to closed session. Um, may I have a motion and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of the appointment, employment, <coughs> compensation, discipline, performance or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint against lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee or a public body that is subject to the local government wage increase transparency act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with this act 5 ILS ILCS 120 slash 2 C1. 
and for collective negotiation matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one of more, one of more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 120-2C2. Um, we are going into closed session, and we will be back. Motion. Motion. Oh. No motion. Yeah, motion. Thank you, Marianne. Second. 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 Thank you, Patty. Paul, please. Okay. Peyton Howell. <laughs> yes. Ting Paul Pong. Yes. Gallowick. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Weedman. Yes. 